Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jana Troutman Miller. I'm the chaplain here at St. John's, and uh, it is it's my privilege to be able to be here to talk to you. But it is very exciting for me that I get to talk to you about the labyrinth. Um, as we are about ready to have our own labyrinth here at St. John's. Um, and so I just thought this would be a really great opportunity um, to talk about what labyrinths are, a little bit of the history of them, how to use them, um, and just so that we have a context for this thing that we now have in our space. And um, I know that for me, as I have journeyed with labyrinths, um, the more I learn about them, um, their use, their history, um, how they can be a benefit to me. Um, it has just made it more meaningful. So, um, you see in my name down there, it says Veriditas Labyrinth Facilitator. So I'll talk a little bit in a minute what Veriditas is, but um, I was, uh, about 12 years ago now, I was trained um, with um, Lauren Artris, who was the founder of Veriditas, um, to be a labyrinth facilitator, uh, to be able to, to give presentations on um, the labyrinth and especially how to lead people in labyrinth walks. So, here we go. So what is a labyrinth? A labyrinth is not a maze. Uh, mazes have many paths and dead ends and you have to figure out how to get to the, the middle or from one side to the other. There, you get lost in them. They can be confusing and frustrating. And so a labyrinth, though it may look like it, it is not a maze. Rather, labyrinths have only one path that leads from the, um, to the center and back out again. So we'll go talk about each of these different styles, but they each have a, a beginning, and an end, and there is only one path to get to those, and then you walk the same path out. So that's the difference between a labyrinth and a maze. In mazes, you lose your way, and we say in labyrinths, you find your way. So a brief history of labyrinths. Um, the origin of the word labyrinth is relatively unknown. There's a lot of things about labyrinths that's unknown. Um, it's thought to that the word um, from labyrinthos might have derived from the word labyrinth, which is a Lydian word for double-bladed axe, which you will find in, um, in uh, many of the labyrinths. It looks like a double-bladed axe, um, which is the word labyrinth, which they think that's where the word came from. Uh, there's evidence um, of labyrinths being used in ancient times. But there's little documentation of how or why many of the ancient labyrinths were used. So some of them were on walls, some were on floors, uh, some were decoration, but there's just little documentation of what people actually used them for. So some of it is some speculation, some of it is just putting some pieces together of what we think that they were used for. So um, you see them in architectural details. We'll talk a lot about those, especially the ones that we walk. You see them on walls. Um, you see them in landscaping. Those are the ones that I think that we're often familiar with, uh, the, the hedgerows um, of labyrinths and sometimes mazes uh, that you see in, in um, big gardens. Uh, they were used in pilgrimages. Um, one of the speculations they think is around the 12th century it began to be really dangerous to go on pilgrimages to Jerusalem. And so many um, cathedrals around Europe um, began to be pilgrimage sites. And several of those cathedrals had labyrinths in them. And so they, they think that perhaps that was part of the, um, the final stage of the pilgrimage to that cathedral where you would walk the labyrinth in the center um, symbolizing Jerusalem. We see it in art, we see it in paintings, we see it in, um, in mythology, 
Um, it's a metaphor for life's journey. There is, uh, we think about the beginning and the, the journey that we walk on, the end could be middle life, the end could be death. Um, so you see that metaphor in different, in different areas. Uh, they're an archetype that is used across time and cultures. And this is a thing that for me is very exciting about labyrinths, is this isn't just a, a Christian thing that you find in European cathedrals. You find these all over, um, especially Europe, um, even here in the Americas. So this is, uh, it's a little hard to see, but this was etched into a Neolithic tomb. They think sometime between 10,000 and 5,500 BC. Um, and this is, you see the, it is etched in there. Here's another one that they found uh, on a wall in Italy. Again, you, oops, you see it etched in the wall as well. This one is in uh, 1300 BC, some Syrian pottery. Here you see it on Cretan coins. This one was a 12th or 13th century, the Hollywood stone in Ireland. This was found buried next to a pilgrim's trap. Again, another um, reason why they think that it was associated with pilgrimages that along a pilgrim's track, there would be these, these uh, markers along the way letting you know that this is how far you've gone or this, you're on the right track. Um, and this um, labyrinth was etched on a stone um, along that pilgrim's track. Here's some other ones. There were a lot in, you find in Italy, um, to the 12th, 13th century, on, on um, into the size of the buildings themselves. Um, oops, some of them um, were, um, this one itself, these were all on the walls. This one I believe you could walk. This was found in um, a Farsi Bible, a 14th century map of Jericho. Again, a labyrinth. Uh, we, we think about the labyrinth when we talk about um, Theseus and the Minotaur. Um, that, in the, um, the mythology of it, uh, was likely a maze that um, he had to find the Minotaur in, but you see it in many times in art depicted as a labyrinth rather than a maze. Many of the labyrinths that you see has a, the Minotaur in, in the middle of them. Here you see it, uh, this is a painting from the 16th century, Portrait of a Man. And you see the, the lab with the emblem there. Again, no, no real indication of what this meant to this man or to the artist as to why uh, it was placed there. Uh, this is an example of uh, a floral lab. Um, again, the landscape of it. This is a man in the maze from the Hopi Indians. This is something that we see here in the Americas. So this is a labyrinth that has, it is uh, talking about showing how it crosses cultures and crosses time. Uh, that the, the man in the maze for the Hopi Indians, again, describes uh, the cycle of life from, from the beginning of birth to the death and the, the walk through the labyrinth, through the, the maze. Um, as they call it, um, is this is the life's journey. So there are different styles of labyrinths. You saw a few in here, um, and just those um, things that I was describing. The one you see most often, in, in the, especially the ancient ones, is the classic seven circuit or the Cretan labyrinth. And we call when we talk about circuits, the circuit uh, is how many times. The, uh, the path goes around the center. So we have the center, and then there are seven times that it technically goes around the um, center. So this is a seven circuit Cretan labyrinth. Here is one, uh, a, uh, a turf one 
that is uh, a recently designed. Again, you have the man in the maze from the Hopi Indians. And you'll notice this is actually the same design. So this design that we see in Britain, that we see in Crete, that we see in Greece, that we see in Syria, uh, we also see in the Americas um, with the, the Hopi Indian man in the maze. That's uh, an example, you see it most a lot of times on the baskets that are weaved. Uh, and then you see it here that they've used it in, um, as an emblem um, in the courthouse in New Mexico. Um, you'll notice, I think one of the reasons why the, the, the Seven Circuit Labyrinth is used so much is it's actually quite easy to draw. Um, I find that when I'm in a meeting and I'm needing to doodle, I will usually doodle a labyrinth. Uh, and it starts with, I will get the hang of this by the end of this to not be just pressing the wrong buttons. Uh, you start, this is the seed pattern. Um, and when you connect dots to lines, you eventually are able to get this labyrinth. So um, this is, I think, an example of the universal um, appeal of uh, and the the, um, the archetype, uh, if you will, of of uh, labyrinths. We we see in in many different cultures too. The spiral uh, can also be thought of as a labyrinth as well. Um, uh, in a lot of discussions about um, labyrinths, we'll also talk about Dante's Inferno and the different levels. Um, being a labyrinth of sorts um, that is walked through. This is the Roman style labyrinth. Um, one of the things that makes it unique, uh, besides it being square, is with the other labyrinths, you you go you weave in and out of the quadrants. This with the Roman one, you finish one quadrant before you go into the other. And again, it looks like a maze, but it truly is one single path. It has the beginning and the center. This one was a late century Roman villa um, mosaic found in Salzburg, Austria. It was found in the baths there. And it was on the wall. So this one wasn't one that you walked. It was, it was one on the wall. And you see there the, the minotaur in the center. This is the onions. This is one from a cathedral in France. Um, this is a picture of it. So this is one that you would actually walk, um, 16th century. And you'll notice that in it, there's actually, you can see because of the, of the octagon shape, there's a Maltese cross within it, or the St. John's cross. And then you have the medieval 11th circuit. And you'll notice that it's actually the same pattern as the Amiens one, except that the, it's a circle rather than the octagon. But it's the same um, seed pattern as the uh, Amiens one. So the 11th circuit uh, medieval, uh, again, the, cent the beginning, the center, and it, there are eight or 11 circuits that go from the center and, and circle around it. This you see a lot in, um, in Britain. Um, this is a, you find this several times in this uh, cemetery in Compton, England. Um, these are on some graves. This is on like the upper part of um, one of the wall structures, and this is on the outside. So you see them several times um, in, this, in this place. The pictures that we saw earlier, um, the, uh, the portrait of a man, um, and also the, um, one of the Theseus ones. Uh, again, this is the medieval 11 circuit that are um, represented there. This is a modern day one, um, mowed into um, the landscape. And then you have the Chartres um, Medieval 11th Circuit Labyrinth. Um, this is the one that 
um, often gets to pick the most when we're talking about labyrinths just because of its beauty and uh, because it is, it is still um, able to be walked today. So the difference, you'll notice that there is just like, it looks like the 11 circuit labyrinth. Um, the difference is that there are the six petal rosette in the center. There are the lunations that go around. They believe they're called lunations because there are, there's 112 of them or 28 in each quadrant. And they wonder if they were able to keep track of the lunar cycle with these, uh, with each one of these. And then you have the labyrinths here, or the um, double-sided ants. Um, they believe that the uh, the center of um, the Sharp Cathedral labyrinth also had the Minotaur in it, in a in. Um, a, some sort of a medal that was likely um, the during the Napoleonic Wars was um, taken up and made into a cannonball. And this is a picture of the um, labyrinth at Chartres. Uh, the cathedral itself was built in the 13th century. Um, who here has been to Chartres? Yeah, it, it is just such an amazing place to be in. Uh, a lot of folks go there, Not has nothing to do with the labyrinth. It is there because of, it's an architectural wonder that was built likely in, in um, technically in one generation as opposed to over hundreds and hundreds of years that many of the cathedrals were built. And for many years, the labyrinth um, was covered in chairs all the time, um, and people didn't even know that, that the labyrinth was there. Um, but uh, it, it is the ladder they believe was probably put down towards the end of um, it being built in 1220, uh, and again as a pilgrimage site. And it is uh, the Notre Dame de Chartres. So the whole um, cathedral is dedicated to Saint Mary, and um, so the having this be a little bit different than the medieval one with the rose. Uh, being a symbol of Mary um, as well. So lots of, uh, lots of feminine um, um, symbolism within it. This is a picture looking down. Again, you can see where the center had been cut out. Um, but mostly it's intact, as is most of the rest of the um, cathedral, um, because it was throughout the, the different wars, it was saved either by townspeople, uh, people would come in and take the stained glass windows out and, and hide them or bury them so they wouldn't be destroyed, and then once all clear, they would put them back in. Um, it just, throughout the wars, miraculously, the shark cathedral was, was saved, um, and, and with it, the, the labyrinth. This is an 18th century engraving again, with the ladder there, um, but a little description of what it was actually used for. This picture of me walking it uh, 15, 14 years ago. And this is um, three years ago when I was there, and I, I know that on Fridays they are supposed to take the, they supposedly take the chairs off. So I went on a Friday, and this particular Friday they had not removed the chairs, so I wasn't able to walk in. Uh, but this is most of the time what it, it, it's like when you walk in. So folks, people don't go there for the labyrinth per se, they go there for um, the architecture. Um, and also, if you have um, had it recently been there, it has been restored. Uh, it is, I walked in three years ago, and I'm like, I'm, I've got a pretty good memory of what this place was like from 10 years prior to that, and I didn't recognize it. And it is completely gleaming white now. It's just amazing. Uh, so that, it took me a minute when I first went there after the, uh, to realize that I wasn't even in the right place. <laughs> so and then we have modern day labyrinths. Um, about, uh, in 1985, um, Lauren Artris, who is an Episcopal 
priest, and she was canon for spirituality at Grace Episcopal Cathedral in San Francisco, had been on a retreat where somebody had a labyrinth at this retreat in 1985. And that began for her the uh, her journey with labyrinth. She had never seen one before, she'd never heard of it before, and so she just dove right in to trying to figure out what the labyrinth was, what the history of it was. Um, sometime between 85 and 90, she decided to go to France and to go to the cathedral to find all of the chairs um, on the labyrinth. And it just happened that nobody was around that day, so her and her companions moved the chairs off of the labyrinth uh, so they could walk it. And, um, and then they began to really study it. And they believed, so then they, they came back and um, reconstructed, this is an exact replica of the Shark Cathedral, um, painted in, in San Francisco in 1991. And they believe this may be the first one that had been installed anywhere in 250, 300 years. Because they just kind of went away. They just kind of went into the background, or literally, on the floor of shark just kind of disappear into the floor. So this is a modern day one um, of a replica of the Grace Cathedral one in San Francisco. And then, um, so Lauren then, after she uh, was able to put this in, she started Veritas, which is um, a, a worldwide labyrinth um, discussion and groups, and, and that's who uh, I trained with her to become a facilitator. That's how I, um, you know, was able to gain knowledge in, in labyrinths. Uh, this is one um, just down in Illinois, actually. Again, it's the 11th Circuit. It looks a little bit different. This is one made out of daffodils. Here is a Cretan one. This is a really unique one that um, is uh, sometimes people will use them in weddings and, and the, um, the couple will walk in it together in different paths and then meet together in the center. These are some finger labyrinths, actually the ones that are back here. Um, for those that can't walk it or you don't have one around, those can also be a meditative tool to use um, to trace with your finger. Uh, this is the Aurora West Alice Medical Center Healing Garden Labyrinth that I helped design uh, when I worked there. Uh, the path uh, is about three and a half feet wide, so it fits wheelchairs. Um, it's a really lovely space uh, to be able to walk. This was the portable labyrinth in the Taylors that we had uh, last year several times uh, throughout the pandemic when Taylors wasn't being used. Um, so we were able to lay that down. That's now folded up in my office along with many, many other things in my office right now. And then this, for those of you who have not seen it, this is our new labyrinth. This is in the, the very northeast corner of our building. And then the room itself is going to be shared with uh, like uh, the, it'll be like a dance studio and yoga and Zumba and those sorts of things will also be in there. Um, and then we'll have time set aside and especially in evenings, um, the, the labyrinth will be open to, for folks to be able to walk. We'll have music in there. Um, the lighting is really lovely. Um, and there's a, uh, lots of windows in there as well. So in itself is a shark style seven circuit labyrinth. So here it is compared to the shark labyrinth with the eleven circuits. This is ours and it has seven circuits. So as we think about um, why we, we will uh, be walking it, there's a lot of different reasons why folks um, have walked labyrinths for over the years. Um, and as we saw throughout all these pictures, you see many different uses for labyrinths. You've seen them in art, you've seen, you hear the talk about it in mythology and in stories. Um, you see it in um, gardens, 
and on walls and architecture. There's a lot of different reasons people throughout time and cultures. Um, it is, it's a metaphor, it is universal, it's iconic. Um, and for whatever reason, throughout um, our life as humans, we have been drawn to uh, the path of a labyrinth. Um, and so I, I think for me it helps to know those pieces behind it anytime I walk one because it helps me then be connected to all of those stories. Um, it helps me understand um, what this path either potentially could be um, or um, just gives me a context for what this thing is that I'm walking. So now we'll talk about what it actually means to walk a labyrinth. What are some of the benefits of it? Why, why bother? Um, it can be used for relaxation. Sometimes it's just a nice walk. It can, uh, if, you're, if you're feeling overly anxious, um, sometimes just walking this path um, can be a real way to just um, to relax yourself. It allows you to focus. Uh, there are many times where I just have so many things going on in my head, and I, uh, there's, at that moment, I just can't seem to um, calm down or focus on one particular thing that I know I need to focus on. When I walk the labyrinth, I, I have to focus on each step that I'm taking. I have to focus on that path. And so the more that I'm focused on the path that I'm walking, it allows my mind to focus on what's important, to focus on maybe the one thing I need to focus on. It can be a spiritual exercise. We talked about um, the pilgrimages that folks used. Um, I use it for meditation. I begin, especially the thing that brought me to being um, uh, really interested in labyrinths is years ago, I, I could not sit and meditate. It was very difficult for me to sit still. It was very difficult for me to uh, sit in silence. And so when I discovered the labyrinth, I realized, oh, this is a really good meditative tool for me to focus on. Um, and it gives me, um, it gives me a real a destination. It gives me a time frame to, to walk this path. And the more I walked it, then the more it calmed me enough that I was able to begin to do meditation without walking the labyrinth. I was able to be able to sit and be able to sit in silence um, for longer and longer the more that I worked with labyrinths. So it can be used as a spiritual ex exercise of prayer and meditation. Uh, along with that, it's, it's a real centering um, experience. Uh, as you walk to the center, um, to be able to use it as a metaphor for walking to your own center. Um, it, it can be really neat to walk through the uh, path and imagine you walking inside yourself and to just take a moment to, to walk within yourself and get acquainted with yourself and really get to your center. Um, as you walk to the center of the labyrinth. Uh, there's emotional healing that can happen. Um, it, is, it gives you those times where it, if there is, is a burden that you're carrying, if there is uh, something that has been troubling you, uh, you, can, you can use that as a time to just really think about that experience or think about that feeling you're experiencing um, and we'll talk in a little bit of, of an, an, an actual exercise of going in, leaving it there, and, and coming back out. So there can be emotional healing in it as well. Uh, it's a solace during grief. Uh, I, I have used it a lot in my own grief work, um, in times that I have grieved, uh, to be able to take that moment um, on the labyrinth and just focus on the, the loss I've experienced, um, the, the hole that it's left in my life and, and what that means to me, what does that grief mean to me and the loss that I've experienced mean to me. Uh, and the labyrinth has always, for me, felt like a very safe place, um, an intentional space to, to um, take my grief, to take any of the, 
um, emotional um, needs that I might have to, to um, deal with. Uh, it urges action when feeling stuck. Um, recently, I've had, I've had some decisions I've had to make, and I've got all of these different options. And to be able to walk a labyrinth has been very helpful for me to be able to, uh, again, focus on only that, focus on that decision that I have to make and the impact that um, it's going to have on me, whatever decision it is. But while I'm in the labyrinth, I'm very intentional to really just focus on that issue or focus on that topic so that um, when, I, when I leave the labyrinth, everything else is there waiting for me. But while I'm in it, I'm able to really just focus um, at, at, at what I need to think about. And sometimes it truly just provides a place of beauty, of peace, and quiet. Uh, sometimes that's all we need out of the labyrinth, is a lovely walk, um, a place of some silence, um, a place to, to be able to move around um, and be able to um, um, just have a, a moment to yourself. Or if you're walking it with other people, a moment with other people in, in a place of beauty and peace. So those are some of the, the benefits uh, that I know that I have experienced and other people have talked about experiencing. That doesn't mean that every time you walk on the labyrinth, it's going to be a big aha experience. Um, I, I have walked many, many labyrinths, and I've had a handful of those, oh my gosh, experiences. Um, one of those happens to be when I did walk the, the first time at Chart itself, and I had Oh, I couldn't wait to go there. I, I went and I, this was going to be my pilgrimage to go. And we get to the cathedral. There's hardly anybody around. It was perfect. So I decided I'm going to walk around and just kind of get my bearings around the cathedral itself. And so after about an hour then of touring the rest of the cathedral, I'm like, okay, now I'm ready. I'm going to walk the labyrinth finally. So I get... And I, I, I get on the, the um, path, and I start to walk, and it's wonderful and glorious. And then all of a sudden, a group of tourists get off a bus and just start all over the place in the cathedral. They are just snapping pictures everywhere. And they're not there for the labyrinth. They're there for the architecture. And so they're walking all over the labyrinth, which... For those of us that are purists when it comes to labyrinths, you just don't do that. You can only walk the path. You don't just jump into it. Um, and so I found myself getting so angry, and I just, now I'm trudging through it. Now I'm just, oh, these people are ruining my pilgrimage. I'm like, come on, God. I had been saving this, you know, for this moment, and now it's being ruined. And then I would be really passive aggressive about it. So if somebody was standing in my way on the path, I would just stop and wait for them to move. I wouldn't go around them, I just stopped. And then they would move and then I'd walk by and I would So I trudge my way to the center and I'm like, okay, God, come on. Like, this is, I may never make it back here. And now it's being ruined. You know, just, and I kept just make them go away. And then I realized, Oh, it's not about them. It's not. It's about me. And I also like it was this perfect metaphor for my own spiritual life, and the thing that I'm always fighting against. Like I would love to just walk around with you know oh, behind me all the time, the world, the beauty, everything. But people are always getting in the way and messing it up. And that's just my spiritual life. Like people will. People, I will always get in the way of my spiritual life. So it's up to me to be able to live a spiritual life, whether people are on my path or not. And so I then knew that, oh, well, darn it, it's about me. So when I took the path back out, I knew that I had to change my attitude. They weren't going anywhere. They had pictures to take. They were not going anywhere. And so I, I then started a mantra of just repeating peace, P 
peace over and over again as I walked the path back out. And if somebody came across, I would just move around them and just keep going. And then I was able to have my real spiritual experience that I was looking for. But it was a met, it was this perfect metaphor for how I live my spiritual life. I want everything to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect, so I can't wait for perfection to live a spiritual life. So to be able to find those moments are, are really great on the labyrinth, to be able to take it and use it as a metaphor. And then the other hundred times I've walked a labyrinth, uh, nothing like that happens. It's just been a really nice walk or a nice meditation or to find some peace and quiet. So sometimes you'll have those and sometimes you won't. So we talk about the path being a threefold path. There's of release, receiving, and returning. The path in is the release, the center is receiving, and then the return is the walk out. So we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, what it would be like for us to, to walk those, that path. So you, these, are some, these are some suggestions on what one could do um, as they're walking in the labyrinth. So the walk in, the release. Take in a burden. If you've got something that you're really worried about, take that in with you. As you're walking around, think about, you know, what is this burden doing to me? How does it make me feel? How does it weigh down on me? Just really feel that burden. Feel that worry. Take it in. You could ask a question. Maybe you've got a decision that you need to make. And so you just, what should I do? Who am I supposed to be? What does it mean for me to be living here at St. John's? So just take in a question and really focus on that question as you're walking in. Maybe just clear your mind. Um, use the path to, in the narrowness of the path, which uh, some people think that, oh, the path needs to be a little bit wider so that I, I don't get tripped up on it. But the more narrow the path is, the more you have to focus on it. So that's one of the reasons why we continue to make them a little bit narrow. So use, use that narrow path to really just clear your mind of stuff and focus on the, each step you take. You can repeat a mantra. Uh, a lot of folks will use, I often will re, um, use just be still and know, be still and know, or peace, or om, or whatever, whatever, if you have a centering prayer that you do, um, to use that over and over. You can just simply pray. You can use, you can use that to pray to, as you're taking in that burden, as you're asking that question, or as you're clearing the mind, to use that to, um, to, to pray. Or just take the first step and see what happens. Then when you get to the center, that's the receiving part of it. So if you've taken in the burden and you have, um, you've really felt what it's like to carry that burden with you, the, the heaviness of it, the worry of it, when you're in the center, imagine yourself releasing the burden. Imagine yourself leaving it there. And now, of course, the burden, will, it's not going to magically be taken away from you when you're on the labyrinth. But imagine for yourself, giving yourself permission for just those few moments to just leave it behind. What is your life? What would it be like to just not carry it with you? If you've asked the question while you're in the center, maybe stop asking now and listen. That's often most of the time when I'm praying and I'm not um, hearing an answer is because I haven't shut up long enough to hear God's answer. And so this is a good time to just be silent, to be still, and to listen for the answer that you are so desperate to hear. Again, you can pray, you can meditate, you can stand in it, you can sit in it. Ours especially is big enough that you can if you want to crawl down on the floor, you can. If you want to maybe put a chair there before you start walking it, and so then when you get to the center, you have something to sit on, you can do that. You can just rest while you're there. Um, allow yourself to take in the path that you just walked. Or you can stay as long as you want to and see what happens. And then the walking out, the returning, returning back into the world, so to speak. 
So you've taken in a burden, you've left it in the center. Now on the path out, imagine yourself, allow yourself to feel what it might be like without carrying that burden. Again, the burden will be there. The, the, whatever it is that you've been worrying about will be there when you leave the labyrinth. But just for that moment, allow yourself to imagine yourself without carrying that burden. And the more you're able to imagine yourself not carrying that burden, you can begin to think about what, what are you choosing to continue to carry and what do you need to release? And then how might you be able to release that? So if you can do it in this labyrinth, then taking those bits of it out into the world, into your real life, and finding ways of releasing it then as well. So if you've asked the question and if you've listened for an answer, what does that answer mean? Taking that out on the path of, of pondering what that answer or what you think that answer might have been. And even if it was just kind of a glimmer of something or a new thought, a new idea, what does that mean for you? You can pray, you can meditate, you can say a mantra again, you can clear your mind, or again, take the first step and see what happens. So those are, the, those are some ideas of what to do when you're walking the labyrinth, when you're going in, when you're staying at the center, and when you're coming back out. So what happens in the labyrinth? Could be lots of things or nothing at all. Like my description of my, my walk at Chartres, it was amazing. And then the next time I was on a labyrinth, nothing. And that's okay too. It was, but it, it still stilled me. It centered me. It helped me learn how to meditate more. Um, you may get clarity on an issue or a question in your life. Using everything as a metaphor. So that, that trip around chart for me, it was a metaphor for my life. Um, we, as we talk about the labyrinth being one path, it's not a maze. But you'd be amazed at how many times people get lost in it because they don't trust the path. You can see it. People are walking and all of a sudden they stop. And they're not quite sure where they are. And instead of just walking, I will see them step over into the other path and then they're lost. And then they end up back at the entrance before they get to the center. What's the metaphor for their life if that happens? If you get into the labyrinth and it makes you really anxious, if, if following this path, this narrow path, makes you anxious, what's the metaphor for your life? Um, I once did a, I had a group, it was a teacher and her students, and um, I led them in the, in the labyrinth, and I, sometimes I would walk really quickly and they'd have to keep up with me, and sometimes I'd slow to a crawl. And they'd have to, and the students were fine. The teacher was going crazy with this because she wanted to go at her own pace, and I knew her quite well, and I kind of knew that that would drive her nuts. Um, <laughs> but it was a great metaphor for her of needing to be in control. There is absolutely no right or wrong way to walk the labyrinth. So if you do get lost and you make your way back to the entrance before you get to the center, that's okay. It's perfectly okay. You can just keep walking in. You haven't done anything wrong because there's just no wrong way to do it. You, um, you might get to the center and you realize, you know what, I don't, I don't need to walk the path out. I don't feel like walking the path out. That's okay. Just step right over it and go on out. That's okay too. Sometimes you just want to get to the center. So maybe, oh, I'm just going to cut across. If that's the path you need to take, again, what's the metaphor? But there's no right or wrong way for it. It's your life. It's your path. When you're walking it, you go at your own pace. Um, sometimes you can walk labyrinths um, in a group. And so uh, you might get behind somebody that's going slow, and that might really drive you crazy. Well, you can walk around them. That's the, the great thing about the permission. And, and when you are on the group in a group, you just say, if, if somebody is going to walk around you, it doesn't mean you have to speed up. 
Just let them walk around you. So go at your own pace. Stay in the center as long as you need to. Take the same path out if you like. Um, when you're walking it with, with several people, remember that it's a two-way street. You might be going in as somebody is coming out. And so uh, you greet, and especially if you're doing it like in a retreat, um, and it's kind of agreed upon, sometimes you might, you might say, you know, when we, greet, when we meet each other, don't greet them because you were trying to do it silently or whatever. Or you may decide, um, as we greet each other, we can touch hands or embrace or nod or say something. Um, but let that be agreed upon. But just remember that you're going to meet somebody going out. Does that trip you up? Does it make you angry? Again, what's the metaphor? And remember that it's not a high risk activity. So, because there's no right or wrong way, you're not gonna mess up. If you do, it's okay. Um, you're, you're not going to explode if you don't do it right. So it's just not a high risk activity. Um, so, try it, enjoy it, or not. Maybe you walk it and you'll hate it and you'll never walk it again. That's okay too, it's, it's not for everyone. Lauren Artris writes, the experience of walking a labyrinth is different for everyone. Just bring your own unique hopes, dreams, history, and longings of the soul to the journey. So that the, this beautiful thing that we now have here at St. John's um, is for your journey, and you get to use it how you need it or not. If you choose not to, that's fine too. Um, but just know that it's there, that um, there's a lot to explore on it. Um, it can be fun, it can be enlightening, and sometimes it can be just a nice walk. So that's my presentation. What questions might you all have? And if you do have questions, there are microphones along there. Please ask away. Will there be a time when the, it's a set time when the trace is empty so it's not covered all day long? Yes. So once we, once we figure out like what the, um, the schedule is going to be for yoga and those sorts of things, those will be on the calendar. We will also have a separate, uh, we'll have a labyrinth time on the calendar as well. And then if nothing is on the calendar at a time, the labyrinth will always be open. We're going to set a labyrinth time just as a reminder for folks and so that it's on the calendar and kind of keeps it in people's minds uh, to be able to come down and walk it. But especially in the evenings, um, it'll be it'll be look, likely be open and free and everything. So yeah, and I, the handouts that I have here will be in there as well. So there's some ideas. Um, the the two Lauren Artris books there and the other blue-ish uh, labyrinth book are um, books I purchased for St. John's. Um, so those will be in our library outside of the chapel um, to give you more information on the labyrinth. There's tons of stuff online. There is um, labyrinths um, that you can follow on the internet. I've actually, on my YouTube channel, I have a video of me walking a labyrinth in a Kanama walk. So you can, if you're not walking a labyrinth, you can follow, a, all you see is my feet walking it and it can be used as a meditative um, thing. Um, if it, we've got the finger labyrinths here as well, um, which can be utilized. Um, and um, and probably along the way, I'll probably do some, you know, some um, intentional labyrinth walks for folks. Um, so kind of as a, a retreat or something like that to see what it's like um, in a group, which can be nice as well. This is going to say a whole lot more about me than the labyrinth. <laughs> I can already anticipate that if I go to that room and there's the lever, and I start walking it, and someone comes in, I'm going to be very self-conscious. Mm -hmm. So how do I get past that? Well, I would say I would I would um, allow yourself to to before you start walking it, prepare yourself for if somebody happens to come in. Um, I think one of the things too, and that's that's also just kind of gives me an idea of that when it is. T the labyrinth time to have a sign there to say 
um, you know, to ask people to come in silently um, because somebody might be walking the labyrinth. We'll also have music in there as well, so you can pick some um, some music for people to to walk to. I like to walk a labyrinth with music. Um, I try not to have um, labyrinth uh, when I walk a labyrinth with singing uh, because that can be distracting. So it's usually most of the time music we have will be um, um, just instrumental. Um, you could bring your own, it'll be a CD player, so if you've got something that you meditate to or that, or maybe you do want to walk it with um, vocals, you could do that as well. Um, so I, I guess my, my uh, advice if you're worried about somebody walking in and now I'm self-conscious, prepare yourself for it before you even start walking, before anybody starts, uh, comes in. And so that you have that mindfulness um, and so then you can choose in the moment how you're going to respond rather than, uh, oh, now I'm surprised, and then you don't necessarily have a choice. But you maybe, okay, well, before I go in, if somebody walks in, I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do to respond and choose it before you even walk in. Yeah. Which is another great metaphor for our lives, right? <laughs> Anything else? Well, if you have other questions, you know where I'm at. My office is right by the chapel. Um, and uh, I'm delighted that you all were interested enough to, to come today. So thank you very much. Thank you.